How should Christians treat migrants who have come to the United States? Hey, I'm Pastor Chris. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Recently, we had that Trump rally in Ohio where he talked about some, uh, sounds like not all, but some migrants are not people, he said, that they were animals. But then he went on to describe uh, the migration into the United States, which is concerning. It's a very concerning thing that we have such migration in the United States. But he pretty much started to describe it as if everybody coming into the United States were criminals or mentally ill uh, terrorists, people just being dumped as if uh, nations were just dumping their prisoners and they're mentally ill at the border for them to come across and they're, they're coming in and bringing all this havoc and, and causing all uh, this destruction in the United States. It's interesting to me, uh, as he talks about this, uh, to note that the FBI statistics and things that I've seen is that uh, migrants uh, commit less crime than American city, uh, citizens proportionally, um, probably because they're afraid that if they do something and they get caught, they'll get kicked out. Yes, there is a lot of violent crime uh, done by migrants, but so is it being done by American citizens. In the little town that I live in, a city of about a little more than 10,000, a few weeks ago, we had eight shootings in one week, and most of them were gang-related. Uh, and these were not migrants doing the crime, it was American citizens. So there is a lot of crime. There is a lot of things going on in the world. Although the FBI is reporting over the last several years, violent crime is actually down, not up in the United States. But all that uh, comes together uh, to talk about this issue of, of migrants coming to the United States. And I was going through and just looking at some of uh, former President Trump's uh, statements over the last five or six months about immigrants and migrant uh, people coming to the United States. And I just kind of saw some, some of this pattern developing and then it caused me to say, I, I know a little bit about what the Bible says about uh, migrants, uh, what the, in the Old Testament English language uh, is often translated sojourners. Uh, but let me go back and just relook at, at some key passages and see uh, what the scriptures say so I can better understand as a Christian, how, how am I to respond to these migrants? I don't want uh, to talk about the politics and how we deal with migration in the United States. It's an issue that is as old as, as human beings. People, we see even in, in Genesis, we see after Cain killed his brother Abel, he migrated. Uh, we see migration all, all over and all through the scriptures. So migration is not something new to, that's happening now in the United States. It, it happens throughout the world. It happens uh, probably more often than we as Americans are aware of because we're not living in the countries that are having refugees come in uh, for famine. Oftentimes it's famine. Uh, refugees come because of war. Refugees often come because they're an oppressed or persecuted minority in their home country and they're just trying to find a safe place to be to live and raise their families. So I just wanted to, to look back and uh, I saw uh, this October 2023 speech where uh, Donald Trump said, I will, be impl I will implement strong ideological screening on all immigrants. And he did identify groups such as terrorists and things like that. But then he also said that that ideological screening would include people who don't like our religion. And I said, well, what religion is that? Who, who decides what our religion is in the United States? Because we, we uh, have in our constitution the prohibition to establish a religion. We can't have an official religion in the United States according to the constitution. So who decides what our religion is? So, judging from the crowd he was speaking to, I'm, I'm guessing he's talking about Christianity. But as a Christian, I don't expect Jews or Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists 
or the increasing number of atheists and pagans to like Christianity. Uh, I, I don't expect people that have a heart invested in another religious system and worldview to embrace mine. It is my job as a Christian to persuade and appeal and talk to them and share my faith and the reasons for my faith and proclaim the gospel message. Uh, but that is all I can do. I can't force and put some kind of ideological test on people to say, you can't come to this country unless you, you say you like Christianity. I, uh, that would be establishing a religion in the United States and, and that's not even constitutional. So I don't really understand why he said that. Uh, in November uh, 2023, there was a story that came out in the New York Times that was confirmed by uh, close advisor Stephen Miller that Donald Trump plans to build detention camps on the Texas border, near the Texas border, for th these mass deportation efforts and was going to use military funds uh, because they feel that Congress wouldn't approve it. And they probably wouldn't uh, build these kinds of camps. The last time we built camps in our country uh, was in World War II when we built them to detain Japanese citizens during World War II because we were suspicious that they might betray the country. The, uh, and and I, I don't even want to say in this feed, you know, there's, there's a, another country during World War II that built camps to detain certain people. Um, March 2nd in North Carolina, he said we will begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. So there is this idea we're going to round up migrants, everybody that's come to the country. We're going to have to sort them out, figure out who's here legally or illegally. So that's going to involve a lot of police uh, finding out who needs to be deported and what does that mean? What 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 does that look like? I'm not sure. November 2023 in New Hampshire, he said, uh, we pledge to you to root out the communists, Marxist, fascists, and radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. I'm thinking he's probably talking about politicians, but beyond that, who are the Marxist, communist, fascist, radical left thugs that are living in this country like vermin and how do we root them out and how do we uh, find them? It sounds to me like a lot of police interrogation and finding out maybe who these foreign people are that are promoting these ide ideologies. Again, it's, it sounds like a lot of, of police kind of intrusion and in, in finding uh, these people that he's talking about. Uh, the, this Saturday uh, and, and December 16th in New Hampshire, 2023, he talked about immigrants poisoning the blood of our country. And again, that's that's echoing some things that happened uh, in, in uh, Germany in the, the leading up to World War II. Uh, and and uh, so now in light of all that, he comes and says uh, this last Saturday that you're talking, uh, really going on an extended rant about migrants and people coming in the country and talking about how dangerous uh, gangs, uh, Grant, there's probably gang members coming in. There's probably terrorists coming in. We're not guarding our, we, we just don't know who's coming through our border. I mean, there, there needs to be better screening, better things being done for, for sure. Uh, but I, not all people coming in, not all migrants are terrorists or gang members or criminals or mentally ill or released uh, from prisons and dumped at, at the border. And he cited a lot of things with, without any proof. But here's my concern, because we begin sowing all these things. And then you look at people in the country who are not white and have an accent. Some of those people may be naturalized United States citizens. Some of those people may have legally immigrated and have green cards, their work papers, and some of them may have come across the border without uh, any paperwork and, and are, not, are not here uh, properly, that they're, they're here against our immigration law. So now everybody begins to look and you're stoking and stirring up this fear and 
all of a sudden you start thinking that any particularly male that's not white with an accent is a gang member or is a terrorist or is there to hurt or harm you. And that creates an environment of fear and suspicion. And out of that fear and suspicion comes a lot of oppression. So not just people that are undocumented or illegal, however you want to say it in our country, but we're talking about all sorts of people, people that are here illegally who are not white with an accent. Uh, people here that are citizens that are not white with an accent. People begin to to view them suspiciously, begin to put up their guard, and then begin to act in oppressive ways towards people that aren't like them. And I'm concerned that some of this rhetoric is going to begin to spill over more and more into how people are being treated. And I, and I think that there will be more and more people coming forward saying, I am suffering oppression. I'm being hurt and I'm being harmed because I am not white and I have an accent and people make presumptions about me that aren't true. And I think that's a danger. I think uh, we really need to tone things down. And as Christians, I think we can take the lead in that. But before I share those these verses, I want to tell you a quick story that um, uh, that happened to me a number of years ago. Oh, I must have been about a decade ago, I think. Um, my wife and I have, and our family, our kids who uh, you know grew up, uh, have have known us to be led by God to open our hearts and our lives to the least of these, the fatherless, the widow, single mother. We, we kind of view that as a category of being a, uh, uh, a widow who's uh, the father of their children or fathers of their children have all gone and abandoned them. And, and, and these kids are being raised alone and there's poverty and there's oppression and there's suffering and there's hardship. And we've invested a lot of time and quite frankly, a lot of our our own personal wealth, even when we don't we don't even have wealth or or money that we didn't have or couldn't afford to give, we've done to to help others. And so, one day, one of the vehicles that we had broke down. We had no money. There's no way I could get it fixed to go to go to work. And so, I didn't know what to do. And then a friend of ours who uh, was from another country said, let me call an old friend. And she called him and he said, bring your car up. You can get it up here. So I, I can't remember how we got it up there, but we got it up there and it was this garage and with all these old used cars around. And it turned out that this man was in a migrant he, in the country illegally. And he uh, had a repair shop where he fixed the vehicles of other people that were migrants that were in the country legally. And he took our car in the shop and took a look at it to find out what parts he needed to get from, from a junkyard and he did work and he fixed our car. And when it was all said and done, you know, I went to settle up with him, just think, thinking, how am I gonna even afford to pay this? And he said, no, in, in his, in his uh, heavy Spanish accent, Mexican, he said, no, 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 no. And uh, he, he, we were sitting in this room and he was saying, it's been told to me how you care for children, for children of people like me. And I, I you know, I didn't know what to say. I said, yeah, but that's my wife and I, that's our heart. We, we want to invest our lives in children. And then he started talking and I could see, cause he had the tattoo. There's certain tattoos 
that uh, gang people wear to show how many people they've killed. And, and he's had the tattoos of killing multiple people. And he started to get emotional and he said, when I was eight years old, my family was too poor to take care of me anymore and they left me on the streets. And I tried to survive for two years, but when I was about 10, the, the organ harvesters came around and there's a black market for organ transplants where they'll pluck kids off the streets in these Mexican cities and, and they will basically kill the children in order to provide organs on the black market uh, for people that need organ transplants. And he was afraid of that. So he, he got himself connected up with the cartels because they offered protection. And the cartels sent him to the United States as a teenager. And ever since he got to the United States, he just wanted to be free from the cartels. He wanted to do his own thing. He wanted his little repair shop. He didn't want to do the deeds that the cartels would tell him to do. And more and more as he got older, they were leaving him more and more alone. But he started to tear up and he said, I don't want I don't want the children to have to live like I've lived. I don't want that for them. I want them to be okay. And people like you uh, that don't see children of people like me like trash, but as human beings who show them God, I, I want that. And so I fixed your car to tell you thank you for what you are doing. And my heart was really struck by that uh, as he was saying that it, it, it really gripped me to begin to realize that a lot of people get trapped into things they don't want to be trapped in and they find that there's no escape, poverty, a lot of other things. There's no excuse for what he had done. And um, I, I think he knows that. I, but at the same time, he was a gang member that just wanted to be free from the gang. And getting to the United States was a step for him to get away from the cartels and try to find a way to be free. So maybe think of this from another perspective. Maybe some people are coming here to the United States because they want to be free from bondage to, to evil, wicked people. They want to be free from all those things that they're forced to do in the country they're coming from. They want to be free from oppression and they want to be free uh, to have a family and raise a family and live a life. And many people that are coming, it's not that they are criminals, that they are just oppressed, they're poor and they have no hope and they feel like the journey uh, to the United States is their best chance of survival. And if they could just find a way in and live and work, that they can experience the promise of the United States that they see on TV and, or, or, or however they, they hear it. Uh, it's like uh, Ronald Reagan said, we're, we're this shining city, a beacon on a hill. Or I can't remember exactly how he said it, but this idea that there, this is a place where, where people can come and escape oppression and raise families and take care of them. So that's been part of history, not just here in the United States, but people are always in history been migrating to places where it's safe to raise their family, where there's no war, where there's no famine, where there is no oppression. And in a way, these migrants are coming here because they feel that this is a place where they can find peace to raise their children and, and to work and to live and to not face the difficulties of where uh, they've come from. Yes, some are probably terrorists. Yes, some are gang members and they're bringing fentanyl in and uh, they're human trafficking and they're doing all sorts of wicked and evil things. And yes, we need to pursue them, arrest them, Put them, put them in jail for the rest of their lives for the evil that they're doing to other people. I 100% agree with that. But not all, and probably not even the majority of people are coming into the United States are doing that. 
So I, I do want us to maybe as Christians rethink some of what God says and how God has called us to treat these migrants that the, that the Old Testament call sojourners. I want to just read a few scriptures to you to wrap up this video that you can reflect on and meditate upon as we think about this issue of how we deal with migrants as Christians here in the United States. This is from Exodus chapter 22, beginning of verse 21. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Exodus 23, you shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19, beginning in verse 33, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall do him no, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, as you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 24, Beginning in verse 14, you shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. Verse beginning verse 17, you shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or the fatherless or take a widow's garment and pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in, slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. Deuteronomy 27, uh, verse 19, cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow, and all the people shall say, amen. There's a very clear thing that God was saying to his people uh, in, in Israel. And, and as spiritual descendants, as Christians, we're the spiritual descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is our story as well. Uh, and we hear this command about not oppressing, hurting, or harming, and bringing justice to, to those who are migrants, those that are sojourners. Uh, this is our what our heart is to be. And Jesus actually uses this uh, these uh, passages in a way. He alludes to them in Matthew 25 when he talks about the final judgment. You know, James says, faith without works is dead. And Jesus carries and takes this idea that faith without works is dead and says that faith real genuine saving faith, if you have it, is going to reflect in how you treat the marginalized and the oppressed. And, and this is going to be one of the great witnesses at the end of time of who's truly saved and who is going to go into judgment. Uh, Jesus said this in uh, Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For the, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? 
And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. My friends, our faith is reflected in how we treat others, especially the poor, the fatherless, the widow, the migrant, those who have the least are our most vulnerable. The biggest test of our faith is how we deal and treat with these. And if our heart is angry and bitter and full of hatred and we despise those people, that is a sure reflection that our faith is dead. It's, it doesn't have any works. It's not real. It's just uh, what James says in James 2, even the demons believe and shudder. It's the faith of demons, not the faith of the saved, to have a faith that does not drive us to do good works that bring glory to our Heavenly Father. Just something to think about, my friends, uh, as we talk about these important uh, debates about migrants in our country. And I do think we need to change the tone and tenor of how we're talking about these issues and recognize that we're talking about human beings made in the image of God, worthy of dignity and respect. And that though migration is an issue that our country is dealing with, that how we deal with it and how we treat those migrants says a lot about us, especially us as Christians. What kind of Christian are we going to be in this whole debate? And how are we going to treat the migrants who are among us? My friends, I would encourage you all to think about it. Thank you. Have a good day.